<laughs> Hi, welcome to everyone's favorite segment, Mailbag. We have a special guest who's dropping something off and picking up. Say hi to Josh. Hi. He's, um, if you've seen, the winner of the um, $5 Di JCAR Digitech um, special scope. And he's local here in uh, Sydney. He's, you're 13? Yeah. 13. And he's got his own lab and making his own stuff and um, is starting to sell boards for the new framework. Laptop. Laptop. So what boards? You've got like several different boards. Um, well, the one I'm about to sell is a UART board. Yeah. Um, I have an Ethernet one which failed and then the company came out with uh, one so I've stopped working on that. I have mm. a serial adapter for networking gear so it has an RJ45 port along with a basic serial adapter to a DB9 connector. And you've got uh, pre-orders for these? Uh, not quite. I have I have interest. Yep. Uh, I think seven or eight people for the UART one specifically. Awesome. Um, but otherwise I'm going pretty well. Excellent. And, you, and you're going to make these in-house by hand? Yep. Yep. Awesome. I'll link it in down... There'll, there'll be a link, I presume. You'll give me a link to put oh, down below so where people can I order these. I have my these. store yep. starting to get set up. Cool. Uh, well, we'll try and put the link down yeah. below. Anyway, awesome. Well done. Um, framework, what's what's the interface? What's the framework It's just interface? bog Is standard a... USB-C. Oh, it's just USB-C. Yeah. Okay, so your little adapter boards to yeah. uh, convert USB-C yeah. into anything. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Awesome. Is there like a like a? I haven't looked at really the framework yeah. module. Is it like a? Uh, is it like a defined space or volume of? Is it like a plug-in thing or is yeah, it? Well, it's, it's it's internal, isn't it? Is well, it, you can swap them out. Yeah. The hot spot. Okay. And the the length of them is you can't change that, but the right. um you can extend out the laptop a bit. Got it. Along. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, anyway. Here is the scope. Ta-da! <laughs> you haven't got a scope. Yeah. How, how are you designing these boards without a scope? Well, same, same way I used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the time the designs are quite simple. Yep. And the data sheet covers yep. everything. And most of the time my designs, as soon as I assemble them, they work. Oh, I hope they. I hope your next one fails. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> but seriously, I hope it fails so that yeah. you can troubleshoot it yeah. with your new scope. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you learn a lot more if your stuff fails. If it works yeah. first time, it's like, yeah, it's okay. You've learned some yeah. stuff. But if it fails, then you, yep, that's when you my, really learn. My Ethernet one, I um, messed up on the differential pairing. Ah, yep. Yeah. yep. And I, I had these capacitors and resistors for um, the USB signals, and I just removed them so it would back down to USB 2, and it worked Fine. Oh, nice. So, oh, okay. So it was a signal integrity thing, yeah. you think? Oh, okay. Well, that's even this is not going to help with that, unfortunately. It's yeah. too high a yeah. frequency stuff. But yeah, nice that you figured that out. And yeah, yeah it drops back down. Awesome work. Anyway, thank you. Um, so enjoy the scope. Yeah. Fantastic. It's got some probes with it as well. Yeah. So, yep. And you're dropping this off. Where did you get this from? Uh, my dad's lab. Your dad's lab. What does your dad do without giving uh -huh. away? Too much. Industri he's an industrial chemist. Right. Right. Okay. So it came from an industrial chemistry lab. Yeah. Well, Mrs. EV blog might know. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, this is a, a it's quite hefty. It's a it's a Metler Toledo made by WAG. It's got two big outputs here, high voltage outputs, and it's what, uh, seven kilovolts or something? Yep. Six point six point seven kilovolts. At five milliamps, except it's European, so it's got instead of the decimal point, it's got the yeah. comma. Yeah. Weird Europeans. Anyway, um, so so do you not know if this works or not? Um, well, I haven't plugged it in, but I did take a quick look inside, and it's not. It definitely looks like something has happened. Oh, inside. okay. <laughs> All right, something's happened. All right, the magic smoke's escaped. All right, so I I looks like some sort of yeah, it generates high voltage. Um, probably some ionizer thing something like that um or some other uh thing where you, in, when you generate high voltage you can actually it actually attracts particles that's how ionizers work and um and that's how the new spacesuits work by the way they're going back to the moon do you know this little factoid uh they're going back to the moon but the spacesuits actually have embedded conductive fibers in them 
so that um, dust on the moon is such a problem that they have to have the embedded conductive fibers and they charge themselves up to I, I don't know what you know several kilovolts or something yeah. and it actually um, it, it actually repels the dust so it stops the dust getting on them so the new spacesuits have a, I don't know they're not going to lug around one of these babies <laughs> but um, yeah anyway little factoid there yeah. so there you go anyway thank, thanks for dropping that off we'll do yeah. a two minute tear down well I'll do it in several days when I'll shoot a mailbag <laughs> video so we're just shooting this while you happen yeah. to be here picking this up so yeah. enjoy yeah. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. All right, let's crack it open. Here it is, 6.7 kilovolts, 5 milliamps, and there's the uh, huge triaxial um, output. Well, they're not triaxial, but, you know, like big high-voltage insulated uh, coax-type connector outputs um, like that. Of course, it's going to be a differential uh, thing like this. That's why, you know, both of these are mains earth connected by the big-ass stud on the side, and that's it, a switch. And it gen just generates a high voltage um, that they use for some ionizing gadget, I guess, um, in the in the lab. Uh, put a decode on the bottom there. 2017. It's got 6.7 here, so I assume that's 6.7 kilovolts. I assume you can get like different voltage uh, models. I got the screws off. How does? Oh, there we go. Oh, we're we're in. There you go. <laughs> just a whoa. Big ass transformer, and wow, that's some crusty rust. Yeah, I can, well, you know, you'd expect it because it's, <laughs> but it's what ionized off all the rust from the transformer. I, I don't know, but, but geez, it's basically um, just a transformer, and that's it. There's your primary coil, and that's your secondary there, and that's that's completely sealed on the output. Um, so yeah, we won't be able to. I mean, I don't think we can take that cap off, can we? Ugh. Oh man, that's crusty as. Wow. Um, I don't know if that's a natural consequence of the high voltage and like ionizing the air, because when you ionize the air. Particles like stick to things um, and that's the whole idea you can get like, you know, the electrostatic um, air filtration systems when you ionize uh, the particle the dust particles in the air they cling to the uh, Fabric of your filter actually I just changed my lab uh, filter the other day you've seen this. This is my uh, blue air uh, Jobby god the filters are expensive and uh, you can see how dirty that is and it attracts all this dust and mine is an electrostatic uh model so it does actually um ionize the uh particles in there um and yeah and they can and they cling to the uh fabric when they're ionized and in the bottom of that we've just got a big ass 1k uh power resistor there i'm not sure why it's not really across the output um it's not like discharging the output or something like that. Sure, why do we need a load there? Jeez, check out the rust on the earth connection. Look at it. Oh, oh wow. Yep, this is all chemistry, folks. Um, <laughs> it's a reason why that has accumulated so much rust. I'll leave that up to the chemists, but uh, oh, geez. Oh, that's terrible, Muriel. But I don't know, like, has this been used in an atmosphere that causes rust? like this but it's obviously i think it's been accelerated by the uh by the high voltage in this sucker anyway if you know precisely then uh please leave it in the comments down below but um uh, yeah i don't know if there's anything in here is there like an output filter there or whatever i i doubt it. i think it's just a uh direct like step up um transformer Really? I think that's all there is to it. We've got a couple of caps down in there. That could be some, just some mains um, input filtering, and that's maybe what the resistor is to discharge those caps, maybe. Um, but, geez, that seems overkill. Yeah, so I'm not going to try and power this up because I don't think I have a high-voltage probe that goes high enough for that to uh, see the waveform, and certainly I don't know how I'd probe down in there. I mean, geez, these things are deep. I mean, that's, that's the cap. That came with it. Um, it had a hard time getting that out, but uh, yeah, um, interesting. Let us know if you've ever used one of these and for what purpose.
So thank you very much, Josh, for uh, bringing that in, and I hope you enjoy your oscilloscope. Um, I've actually uh, filmed this many days uh, later, and he's already uh, re reported a few <laughs> issues with the scope, nothing major, but uh, yeah, he's uh, certainly uh, given it a workout. Hi to all my viewers in Norway. I kid you not, this one's from Thor. Yes, <laughs> Thor, uh, who comes from uh, Blumenholm in... <laughs> No way, I don't want my viewers in Blumenholm. Um, so let's have a look. What? Uh, I was a bit sticking up the tongue at the right angle there. Um, this one contains one of my favourite items, and hopefully one of yours too. Let's have a squiz. It is protected. I see a name which I... I... Wow! It's, no, it can't be. It can't be. There's no note in here. Surely this is not a Casio VI9850 uh, GB, or is that the, um, a, no, Casio TV interface, or is this one of these, um, like, overhead projector ones, but it weighs a ton. What? PAL, it's PAL output. This, it, this looks new in box. I, I know they make the, I've got one of the Casio projection ones. What the heck? What the heck is... This, it's a foldery stand thing? I don't get it. Um, gee, look at that, oh, thick as. Look at that, look at the manual. Oh, it's all in English too. Wow, that's a thick as user guide. Um, here it is. This is new in box. Um, I <laughs> must have picked it up. Casio calculator TV interface. It doesn't, see, yeah. Wow, I had no idea such a thing existed. Look at that. So it's a regular, you know, 9850 calculator or whatever it is, and um, but they've added a TV interface with an output, with a composite output. I didn't know such a thing existed. Let's power it up and have a go. Well, this thing's so big and long, I have trouble fitting it in the frame. Luckily, this is widescreen. Check it out. Yes, it is one of these colour uh, jobbies. It's the colour model. And, of course, the 9850 is incredibly popular uh, calculator in um, schools and stuff like that. And it's got a composite video output. Obviously, for educational use, it makes sense. I mean, you can get the overhead projector one, uh, which I've got. So why not have one of these. And yes, you've seen this before, which is the overhead uh, projector version where you, for those kiddies who don't know, uh, we used to have overhead projectors, which you put a uh, a film sheet on and it would uh, uh, shine light through. Then it goes through a big reflector and magnifier and put it up on the uh, wall at school. And that's how the teacher could you know, magnify and display things um, to the students. But now it's all digital, you know, so you plug it in digitally. So it makes sense to uh, transition from the overhead uh, projector model to, I guess, composite. I mean, nowadays it'd be HDMI, but geez, that'd, uh, that'd really chew some power, wouldn't it? I mean, this one obviously needs a separate adapter for the um, output. I mean, it's just working from the uh, four batteries uh, at the moment. There you go, 4.8 watts. Oh, geez, so that's, that's chewing the juice, I guess. So if you turn that on, anyway, the uh, colors are pretty piss poor on these um, <laughs> but I guess the whole idea is that you know color does, does add some uh, value in there but you know if you're just doing normal operations then it's just your uh, regular um, LCD um, and your regular contrast which isn't too shabby at all okay let's just do some current consumption measurements that's a standby power it's just charging up the caps there switch it on there you go, in normal operation, 2.4 milliamps. That's with the uh, projection off. Let's do it with the projector on. Yeah, I think the uh, projector, uh, the projector, <laughs> the, well, you know, the the projector output, obviously this is designed to go, composite output is designed to go into a wall-mounted uh, video projector, which of course uh, displays the screen out there. So yeah, I think you need the... Uh, plug pack for that because uh, two milliamps uh, consumption that'd be what you'd get uh, just for the calculator itself. Here's the adapter it's got one of those weird ass plugs on it uh, so I'll have to find an adapter for that but uh, there you go made in Japan all of this stuff's made in Japan 4.5 watts it's got a mysterious sink button there I don't know is that like you put a, a pin through and push it? Um, I, I don't know I haven't RTFM'd. Telefunken.
built by born perfectionists. <laughs> I love it. And well, there you go. It works. Um, <laughs> doesn't that look pretty groovy? But it's not a full frame, so I don't know what the deal is there. And I can switch that off. And if we switch it on, how like, yeah, yeah, it just pops up. And if we switch the calculator off, it stays on. <laughs> I've switched the calculator off and yeah, I can't operate it. So I switched the calculator on and now I can operate it. There you go. Hey, groovy, huh? And wow, there you go. Check that out. Look at the huge board they've got on there for that uh, video processing. Obviously, this is a standard um, 9850 calculator up here if we tore them down one before, but uh, yeah, that's all That's all bog standard stuff. I love the battery contacts flapping around in the breeze up here. Nice, that goes into the uh, plastic work. And uh, we've got a ribbon cable also going over here to the um, slide on off uh, button on the top. And interestingly, that says fuse. So I, a TO92, Fuse? Anyone? Well, sure enough, uh, that's an ICP N10 uh, fuse. And uh, d I've found a data sheet that has like Rome um, and branding as well. So, uh, yeah, there you go. I can't say I've ever seen a fuse in a TO92 package. Interesting. I love how they're going for that Japanese tradition of just uh, saying, ah, bugger it, we don't need a connector. <laughs> just a wire straight through. They've used a connector over to here just to, um, uh, you know, eat and aid, and aid in assembly and stuff like that. But yeah, just, just solder pads on the bottom. Yeah, no worries. And you'll notice that the red and yellow wires here, these are just ground connections going to this grounding pad here and over to here, so not through the connector, so that's an afterthought. And they are the blue one as well. The blue one's ground too. So hey, they had some, uh, they had some either like layout or um, even EMI issues there and they needed to join the grounds. I don't know. Well, absolutely no surprises for finding a couple of Sony jobbies in there. So there you go, custom, and then uh, it looks like I'll uh, put a high-res photo over on my Flickr account, as always, um, and you can go for your life, but uh, that's interesting. What's that NEC part there? Just, I wasn't expecting something. Um, that denser footprint, it almost looks like it's, you know, it's a flash memory or something. Sure enough, that's a 256k bit static RAM, so... They're using that to bitmap all the stuff, so they transfer it into that, and then, um, yeah, that's the that holds the bitmap image for the um, screen. But that didn't make sense based on the pin count here to actually control that. It turns out we do have the data sheet for this. It's a video um, uh, sync thingy. I'll put it up here briefly. But anyway, aha, uh -huh, thought I'd have a sneaky peek on the bottom. I thought there was more to it, and my hunch was right. Ta-da! There you go, an Altera Max um, FPGA on the bottom. And that's how they're doing it. <laughs> Interesting, I didn't see that one coming. So there you go, yeah, going old school, implementing all that in the Altera Max. And obviously, you know, back in those days, they didn't have a huge amount of internal memory, so they're obviously using the external memory to uh, map that. So that's an interesting design, how they've taken just the basic um, 9850 calculator, made it into a thicker uh, case and put the um, engineered a big, um, you know, output and then bodged it into essentially the existing uh, 9850 calculator, like bodged the data output and then they use an FPGA to process that, bitmap it into memory and then they um, shoot it out. So yeah, and, and then we put put in a larger case and extend it up and put a on off switch and external power and stuff and Bob's your uncle. Neat, huh? I don't think they sell, you know, these in huge volumes, certainly not like they'd sell to the um, kiddies in the class, you know, it's it's gotta be like two orders of magnitude. So there you have it, that's a great example of how you would like repurpose an existing uh, product for a different, or a in this case, a slightly different market, the, um, the teacher market instead of the student market. And that's how you would integrate it. That's how I'd probably bodge it together too. Instead of like designing the whole thing from scratch or something like that, they took all, you know, all the existing plastics and everything probably and just like, and just, you know, did a new bottom um, shell and stuff and they just re-kept the existing board and then bodged it in by the looks of it and, um, and, and then like made that into a, another calculator line specifically aimed 
it teaches. So thank you um, for sending that one in. That was that was brilliant. Um, it, it seems these are relatively rare out there, uh, you know. So yeah, nice addition to the uh, calculator museum. Thank you very much, Jaden from Belmont in Western Australia. Hold on, my viewers in Western Australia. Oh no, I was, no, I was, I was duped. I thought that was the edge there. It wasn't. That was just the paper. Anyway, I know all my viewers in Belmont. I don't think I've been to Belmont in Western Australia. I don't know. Lots of suburbs. Australia's a big place. We have a note. We have a shopping, a cold shopping bag. I'll keep that. I reuse my uh, shopping bags. Thank you very much. I've got a, um, a, that's a very strange thing for Australia. It's a baseball. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever thrown a baseball. I don't think so. It's just not a thing here. Um, uh, Rocket, uh, the Trash Pandas. That's a good name for a baseball team. The Trash pen. Oh, smarter every day. Oh, be a thinker and a doer. There it is. It's smarter every day. Destin, I've actually met Destin when he um, came to Sydney. Nice bloke. Um, what else have we got in here? It looks like it might be a random assortment. Uh, we've got something. This is like a, um, a, I don't know, something you plug into the mains and you press it. And I don't know, look, random bit of kit. That looks like a security doorbell thing. Ah, second suck of the salve. Um, I swear I'm not using you for e-waste disposal. I had a Kogan smart doorbell um, uh, that kicked the bucket and uh, took it. Yeah, and to see, oh, okay. So this is the receiver. Fun two minute teardown. Yep. Um, there are a couple of screws that went walkabout, but other than that, the parts are there. Yeah, smarter everyday baseball because I somehow managed to get two of them. Feel free to keep it or pass it on as a desired. I think I'll keep that. I don't I like smarter everyday, so I uh, like having some merch. It's going straight to the pool room. So this is a Kogan video doorbell. For those who don't know Kogan, um, is a Ruslan Kogan, I believe his name is. He uh, started out from his garage selling imported TVs and stuff. And now he's this huge conglomerate um, here in Australia that basically imports and sells everything electronic. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's the one who actually beat me to buying the rights to uh, Dick Smith's, um, the, the Dick Smith head, the Dick Smith uh, trademark and um, name and stuff i actually officially on as well in conjunction with uh, somebody else we actually made a bid on um when dick smith was uh folding and uh, rustling kogan he had more money so yeah he, he got the rights to tricky dick's um famous head and uh trademark and website and stuff anyway let's rip it apart well it's just uh full of battery isn't it um but then again i guess it is a video oh no they're not that deep um but it is a video doorbell. There's another, uh, is that the, uh, that looks like a charging board under there. Uh, I don't know. Is that, well, there's no button. That's the buttony doodad interface. Oh, there you go. That one's a bit beefier. Look at that. Oh, there you go. To whack them in series. They just got, oh, well, this one wasn't quite big enough. So we'll just, you know, whack and use a bit more extra space and just whack another uh, one in there. So let's rip that out. And uh, yeah, they've got wires connecting. Um, this battery ring board and the power board. Is that the secret screw? There's a secret screw interface on the back. There you go. Missed that. Um, and there you go. Got an SD card. Right. Okay. So you can, um, I don't know, does it like detect movement and record it? And uh, like stuff like that. I, I don't know. And I'm not going into huge detail here. Those playing along at home can have a look at uh, that part number and decode it. You know, it's just like a, um, a purpose design ASIC for this sort of job that uh, would be used in dozens and dozens of different branded products. There you go. Ooh, something's, something's cracked off there. Ah, oh, it's dodgy little plastic support. Look at those dodgy little plastic standoffs. They're pretty how you doing. Wow. Oh, yeah, look, look at that. Just shattered. Poor quality plastic. Oh, wow, that's terrible, Muriel. Yeah. Wow, that's, they're awful. Anyway, that's just yet yeah, like a plastic insert thing in there. So we've got a board to board interconnect there. And there's your, there's your Wi-Fi or whatever. I assume it's like a Wi-Fi interface um, type thing. So yeah, they've got that on a separate door to board there. And a board to board interface. Can we get this out? You betcha we can. Mr. Screw, ta-da. And there's your camera module. That's, I don't know, yeah, just, oh, oh, there you go, no, it's actually, yeah, it's straight on the, straight on the board, 
down the bottom there there's the sensor then you've just got your lens on top that's pretty common and uh, that looks like it's all sort of like custom designed to go into this so they haven't like bodged on a uh, like just an existing camera module they have sort of integrated that into the USB and oh no no you would see those in like those little cube cameras and stuff so maybe no I don't know anyway there's a uh, per um, movement sensor so yep yep so I'd just I'd say yet yeah, the per just it just sits there powered down and as soon as the uh, per detects uh, movement it will um, then enable and trigger and uh, record video to the S and or screenshots I don't know still images whatever to the um, thing and then alert your receivery doodad so there it is um <laughs> there's your receiving antenna <laughs> cool bananas um yeah and this just uh, th this is the doorbell when somebody presses the uh button on the front they uh but I'm sure it does all that movementy uh job as well but um yeah that's it so there you have it um it's just that's just a wireless doorbell and video intercom I mean it's not Co it's Kogan branded but um yeah it probably is sold under many different names so I don't know if you know who manufactures that leave it in the comments down below but yeah it's probably like a little uh one of the low end um Sony sensors or something like Sony dominate they absolutely dominate the uh market for um you know image sensors and stuff it's incredible but yeah there you go pretty simple don't know how long the battery would last but yeah that'd be going into uh deep power down just um yeah the uh passive infrared those per sensors uh don't take much because well you can get uh, wireless versions of those that last for you know years or whatever um on one like cr uh 123 battery or something like that so there you go thanks for sending that in interesting two minute teardown I know all my viewers in Tasmania, which is like an optional part of Australia. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, to Justin VK7TW for those amateur radios out there in uh, South Hobart in Tasmania. So let's have a squiz. Well, up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh, I ripped some. I hope it's not valuable documentation. I ripped it. I cut it. So what do we got? Shoestring packet radio. Oh, Tom Moffat. Yes. Yes, Tom Moffat um, sadly passed away like, I don't know, five, six years ago or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, used to enjoy Moffat's Madhouse column in um, EA. And I think he had in other uh, publications as well. Um, so, yeah, so this is a listening post. Oh, it's a listening post kit. Okay, because this is the listening post um, project. I remember seeing that back in EA back in the day and thinking, oh, that's pretty interesting. And I wouldn't mind getting into that, but I wasn't really into the ham radio stuff. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> another name I know. Uh, you can blame Peter Parker, VK3YE, for this package. G'day, Peter. Um, while, this, uh, while he was down in, in VK7 visiting family, I got to talking about the Moffat's Madhouse column in EA magazine. I mentioned that I ended up with Tom's uh, box of kits. Oh, you actually inherited Tom's box of kits um because he was selling these kits was he I, I presume he was i didn't know he was selling them direct but that makes sense to remember a little electronics australia royalty yes indeed i have dug out the ea articles include them in the kit i used to read with great interest moffat's madhouse and even build a packet uh pocket packet modem back in the 90s when i got into amateur radio um thank you very much justin so was this um actually packed by tom himself this is this is one of his one of his kits and he'll sell his packet radio like still a thing like can you still like are they still transmitting can you still get stuff can you still receive stuff i don't know there you go um yeah <laughs> wonder where he got his board from but this was um part of tom moffat's original kits you know from 1992 94 and oh awesome i've mentioned this many times uh, back when I was a boy, like, you know, in, in the 90s like this or in the 80s, you take it for granted. You get your double-sided solder mask plate through, uh, you know, PCB with, you know, 6-6 thou uh, rules for, you know, a couple of bucks delivered. 
straight from China, which is insane. You get five of them or something, you know? It, it's insane. But back then, you either had to roll your own boards if you got them made commercially. Um, just even getting, like, a single-sided one um, would, would cost you very significant coin. It could cost you, like, hundreds of dollars for the setup fee and then just getting, like, a panel made. There was none of this shared panel rubbish. That was, geez, shared panels maybe came around mid to late 90s, something like that. And then when I used my first shared panel, I think, but before that you had to buy the whole panel and it was, you know, it was pretty costly to get a board made. Anyway, yep, nice single-sided tin plate jobby. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get the solder mask. Oh, that was fancy pantsy. So you just got the um, uh, tin plate and yeah, just the rolled tin finish on your PCBs. Nice. Good on you, Tom. Thanks for all the articles, mate. So that's just brilliant. Some original Tom Moffat uh, kits here uh, for, the, for the listening post. Please leave it in the comments. Hands up if you built one of Tom Moffat's listening posts. It was a hugely popular project, I think, back at the time that spurned like many variants, I think. And um, yeah, and Tom Moffat, of course, he wrote Moffat's Madhouse. He used to love Moffat's Madhouse, but Morse Ritty, Weatherfax transmissions and stuff like that and you hook it up to your computer i think didn't you and you decoded it yeah there it is ibm compatible world uh full atp picture quality must have a vga system that uses an analog type color monitor um <laughs> that's good uh the false colors are not normal ones in the ega system as well um and they talk about cga 320 by 200 doesn't hold a candle to the vga images and stuff like that um oh that's just that is just great Right, weather facts. Is it like, do they still transmit this? Can you still receive it? I, I don't know. Sorry, I'm not going to go to the. Um, oh, there you go. Wow, orbit followed by the meteor or meteor satellite. Wow, like you could really that'd be really funky back in the day. I was tempted to get one, I think, but um, yeah, I, I never did get around to it. I have no idea what this article's about here, but I just found this funny. Um, I just completed the presentation of New South Wales Department of Administrative Services. Sir Edward, a portly balding expert, gave a talk on behalf of the uh, department. Eccles explained that a routine like this can go for a couple of minutes. I go, like, what? What is this? There you go, you typically put in a do-it-yourself box like that and hook it up to the computer and uh, it's, we've got some scope waveforms there. Back when that's how you actually got wa scope waveforms back in the day, you actually took a photo at the CRT. Yeah, one of the most popular electronics construction projects in recent years was Tom Moffat's Listening Post. Yeah, Tom did this one as well, but it looks like Jim uh, wrote the article and uh, oh, they talk about the micro B computer and stuff like that. Groovy! So there you go, like there wasn't a huge amount uh, to it. Um, uh, fax weather things and uh, I don't know, a satellite geosynchronous plots and stuff like that or something. So I'll uh, leave it in the comments down below. I'm sure someone will know if this thing, if these things would still work. But uh, yeah, you would have to like get, I don't know, can you get like new software? If it does still work, I assume like there's new software and receivers that just receive it or you just get it on the interwebs or whatever. But there you go. Tom Moffat would have uh, packed these kits himself. Good on you, Tom. Thanks for all the fish, mate. So we've got the Listening Post WeSat uh, station here, if that's how you uh, pronounce it. And there's a schematic for it. Looks like it's only a uh, HC4046, uh, a regulator, a couple of op amps, and uh, Bob's your uncle there. So that interfaces um, to, that'd be uh, going to the uh, parallel port of the PC, and that's, uh, you know, that's all she wrote. Or, um, but uh, I, the software was available in an Amiga version and a PC version too. So, so yeah, that's the PC uh, port interface, and there you go, ordering uh, the kit. This is what I used to do when I published my <laughs> things. If you want uh, this uh, software or kit or whatever, then you'd put your address in there, and then people would send you, like, a money order, or sometimes, a lot of the time, I got uh, cash in the mail, and I'd ship them a, um, a stuff back and that's how it was done back in the day so there's also the uh, shoestring packet radio the pocket packet uh, modem here and oh look at that is that an original um Toshiba T1000 series oh do I want one of those I want one so bad they, they um some of the models um, have DOS in ROM, absolutely fantastic. MS DOS in ROM, in boots instantly, absolutely brilliant. I totally remember this article, I remember this photo, and there's what you can uh, get out of these things. And the schematic for this one, quite significantly different. It uses a TCM3105 modem chip. I wonder if you can still get that. I might have a, I doubt it. Um, anyway, yeah, hands up if you built one of these as well. But these are the kits here. So we have an original pocket packet. Uh, kit 
from 92 and includes all the parts and like alfoil down in there wrapped in alfoil absolutely brilliant and uh yeah that'd still work the tin plate pcb jobby in there was that like a from rcs radio or something maybe and there's a 94 listening post kit although the original article was 1992 so maybe he updated it or something like that but uh yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> Classic kits from Tom Moffat. Oh, geez. That's a real blast from the past. And I really enjoyed Tom's um, Moffat Madhouse column as well as his uh, project articles. Even though, you know, I would read every project article and, uh, like, you know, consume them. Even though I had, like, really, you know, I thought, oh, that'd be cool. But, you know, like, and I had no interest in actually uh, building one or whatever. Um, yeah, that's just what you did when you're a hobbyist. There was no internet back then. I won't do the research now, but uh, somebody will no doubt tell me in the comments down below if uh, these things would still work and if I could actually build them up and uh, like get the old DOS software or is there, you know, I'm sure there's more. If they are still transmitting um, this sort of stuff, then I'm sure there's <laughs> like better ways to get it these days. But hey, that was the early 90s. So, you know, we're talking like 30 years ago. Anyway, Tom Moffat, absolute legend of the Australian electronics industry. Hi to all my viewers in Germany and thank you AK Module Bus Computer. That rings a bell. So uh, we might have a second suck of the sab alert. Alert. Will Robinson. So let's check it out. We have a note. Aha, yes, I think I. they said they'd email me to this and, and they'd email. I've got an email from them, I think, saying that they would send one of these because uh, we've seen this before and I've used their um, LCR box on um, several videos. This is a uh, reference capacitor box. So it's, no, I don't think it's a, it's not a uh, decade capacitance box. It's a, like a literally a reference capacitor. So I don't know if they've included like, you know, a, a cow sheet with it, reference capacitors, 1% uh, tolerance jobbies, although the 100 mics are five, uh, percent tolerance and they've measured them um, doesn't say uh, me measured with the Mastec um, MS5308 I'll have to look that up one up but I assume that's a serious LCR uh, meter with much better tolerance as a rule of thumb you generally want when you're doing calibration you generally want like an order if you can an order of magnitude better accuracy than what you're actually uh, measuring than the device under test that you're actually measuring but you know in the ultra high-end uh, metrology end of things, which you can read all about on the EV blog forum, you know, you might only get a couple of times and then it's all voodoo magic and, you know. But anyway, cool. So we've got a knob on there and we've got reference caps. That'll be handy for, very handy, for like testing multimeters. And apparently it sells astonishingly well considering the very limited uh, market. Yeah, well, people love their calibration stuff. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> People are obsessed with uh, calibrating their multimeters and having standards to check against them. Well, why not? Right, so here it is, and it's just got a bunch of uh, different uh, types of uh, one, mostly 1% uh, reference uh, caps on here. And then, of course, um, yeah, there's nothing <laughs> in there. It's just, yeah, a couple of banana plugs and a switch to connect them through. Uh, and they're through-hole jobbies, so you don't have any issues with uh, potentially... Uh, damage them due to uh, reflow soldering that you get with surface mount parts. So anyway, it comes with this sheet here and uh, they're, they're using a Mastec MSR5308 LCR meter and that's that's the nominal spec of that LCR meter. So they're not using a high-end LCR meter at all to actually measure these, um, unfortunately. So, um, but like I don't have my good HP uh, bench jobby anymore. I sold that uh, quite a few years ago. Oh, I shouldn't have done that really. Um, anyway, so they've given us uh, measured values here, but because, um, you know, we're using 1% uh, caps here for anything one mic and below and 5% um, above that, that's nominal, of course. Um, you know, the whole idea of getting, buying one of these is that you actually get the measured values. Unfortunately, with the LCR, like, it's going to be better than 0.5%, right? It could be an order of magnitude better than that, but you don't actually no it's not you know a really high-end uh bench top lcr meter with like 0.1 percent um ac nominal um accuracy or uh something like that but anyway these are the measured uh, values here 
So, unfortunately, um, as I said, I don't have a good LCR meter. So the best I can do here is actually uh, use my Agilent uh, one and could also try out my um, IET one as well. But anyway, there you go. So that's our one nanofarad one. And that is substantially above what we measured uh, here, um, 0.999. So I'm measuring 1.0107 uh, nanofarads and we got uh, 0.99 on the data sheet. So that is a difference of, you know, about uh, one point. Uh, two percent, one point one uh, percent, something like that. But once again, like you don't know, right? We don't have a serious instrument. But I do actually have the only reference capacitor I have here in the lab is this Arco one, and this is um, this dates from. 1967. This is actually a serious bit of kit. This is what you'll find in, this is a transfer standard, a reference standard capacitor, very expensive. These are these go for hundreds of dollars each and uh, these are incredibly stable with time. You could argue that the older it is, the more stable it is. Anyway, this is a nominal 0.1 uh, tolerance, but I have actually measured it on uh, things and it, like, it seems to be bang on. So I can actually um, give you that on my well, Agilent jobby here, and we are measuring at one kilohertz, by the way, and it's bang on, right? So it's bang on. So I'm, you know, I'm fairly confident in this Agilent meter. Once again, this is not good metrology. You know, you'd have to go to X devs, um, someone like that, to actually uh, do this kind of stuff. But the whole idea is that you'd use something like this, not as an absolute reference, but more like a uh, just a reference over time, so that you can compare uh, different instruments and uh, stuff like that. So you can, you know, see if your meters are drifting over time and stuff like that. Because generally, yeah, these will have a temperature coefficient. So these are uh, PP types, these are uh, polypropylene uh, types, except for uh, PET uh, types down here in the high values. Um, there are more stable uh, dielectrics and stuff, but these will have a temperature coefficient. And maybe I can demonstrate that. Let's see if we can freeze it. There we go. She's going up. She's going up. It's got a negative tempo. Which, yeah, don't freeze your uh, reference capacitors, please, because <laughs> you'll come a gutsa. So, but that will come back down. Like, if you, the whole idea is that your lab is at a relatively stable temperature. And you can use your aircon to keep it at like plus minus a degree or something. So, you know, it's, it's pretty good. So, what does that measure on my IET? Uh, higher. Higher again on the IET, but I think my uh, Agilent uh, one is the higher uh, spec meter here. So there you go, 0.99. Nine, and we got 9.995 there. So this is actually reading a bit low according to my uh, meter here. And 99.85, but once again, right, it's the whole idea is that you can use it to see if your uh, meter's drifting and or your, um, if you're comparing different instruments. And of course, I don't have the best leads here, right? So yeah, these are relatively long. I don't have short leads. There's the one microfarad jobby. There's the 10 microfarad jobby. And 100 microfarads, which is this big beast here. Uh, wow, look at that. Wow, 100 mic. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, and there are different dielectrics. So you could go into the whole argument about you know, what's the proper type to use. And I have looked at the uh, data sheets for these. I couldn't find the F46461 in a 1% tolerance. So I don't know where he's getting a 1% uh, tolerance from. So they, they might be a special order, but uh, the data sheet um, didn't seem to indicate but that. But the other ones are like, um, you know, you can actually order them, special order. Normally they're not a 1% uh, tolerance. So you have to read the data sheet and probably get a uh, special order for those. Anyway, that will be very useful here for the lab so that I can compare uh, meters and that's you know that's one of the cool things you know capacitors are really hard to get like absolute ones like in the, as, as you can see here right 0.1% right this is basically one of the best reference capacitors you can get on the market 0.1% um, initial tolerance, but the whole idea is that you you know use them as transfer standards, and you can do your metrology magic, um, and you can um, you know certify them to a greater uh, standard than than that um, than their marked value. Of course, the whole idea is stability with time and temperature. The absolute value doesn't actually matter as long as it doesn't drift with time and temperature. Unfortunately, these polyprop ones 
do, then they're not the best um, dielectrics. You probably can get better, uh, more stable dielectrics, but a lot of them these days are like SMD ones, which as I said, you know, you can cause issues if you don't reflow solder them properly, you could damage them and, and you just don't know. So well, it's a bit how you're doing. So any reference capacitor box, I would much prefer through all jobbies. Anyway, thank you very much, Roger. Um, I'll link in the uh, module A AK module bus DE. I always forget the URL because it's quite hard. Um, and I'll link it in down below if you want one. It's 46 euros VAT. So yeah, it's an interesting and useful uh, bit of kit to have around the lab, especially if you're like, um, you know, evaluating instruments and uh, doing all sorts of other things. And you care about, you know, if your meter's drifting or something like that. It's, you know, obviously like you can, once you get it, get it in a stable temperature, you record the values. It doesn't even matter what the reference values are. Once you record them on your own instrument, and then you can, you know, come back in a month's time, you can measure it every month and see what's drifted. It's unlikely the caps have uh, drifted or aged uh, much in terms of uh, that if you use them at the same temperature. But even then, temperature doesn't make a massive difference, but it, it can. And I've already opened this one up because they didn't put mailbag on it. If you want to send something in, put mailbag, PO Box 7949, uh, Norwest, New South Wales 2153, Australia, not Austria. Thank you very much, Creative. Um, they've sent me these uh, whiz bangy blue toothy thingy majig earbuds. So they've got a wanky little uh, packet here and I really despise these little like hearing aid kind of um, silicon things which are supposed to sit in your ear. I just, I, uh, I like the earbuds that just sit on the outer bit of the ear. Ugh. So anyway, here it is up close, and this is actually rather funky design. It's got the USB-Cs in there, and then a uh, battery uh, level for the, because it does have internal batteries, so you can just take it anywhere and charge them, and left and right. And if we open that, there you go. I'm not sure, well, it's a bit, I've got bright studio lights here. There you go, you can see them actually slowly flash in there, which means they're charging, and you can see that they sit in these little, this little charging cradle here. I know, you know, this is like, everyone's doing this these days, aren't they? We've got two little pin contacts in there, left and right, and they sit in the cradle, and they just start charging from the internal battery. So that's uh, pretty groovy. I assume like that's in the back uh, part of it here, the battery and uh, whatnot. Anyway, um, that's all there is to it, super X5 ready or whatever. Anyway, I spent like an hour or two uh, using these the other night, hooked them up to my shoe phone, and um, they, like, sound-wise, what can I tell you, like, they're, you know, sounded pretty good for dialogue and stuff, listened to some music as well, and they sound pretty decent. Ordinarily, I use these ones, these are uh, die-cast, and they just, like, earbud ones, and they sit in my ear, and they're great. The only problem is, uh, when you've got metal conductive like this, and you do move around, if you do have static charge on yourself, I can zap myself in the ear, but, uh, these are, don't know if you can read that, but Oglamer or something, Oglamer, uh, ones, and, you know, they're not quite as good as these, I don't think, I don't know, like, it's, uh, like, uh, this is not going to be an audio review, uh, thing, and, yeah, I can't really get you the proper audio output of these things unless you had like an artificial ear or something and then like a microphone plugged into like an artificial ear and then you can plug it in. But yeah, I don't like how, I just don't like this style of silicon thing which goes inside my ear. I don't like having my ears plugged up with these things. It just, it, it just feels weird. I'm not comfortable. That's just a totally personal thing. I know other people just absolutely despise these things and think they're horrid and old school and they love the bass they get with the nice sealed earplugs and wank, 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 wank. Okay. No, not really a fan, but they do sound okay and they do work. And I do like the mechanism uh, here and the fact that, you know, you can just take this. I don't know, like, the specs of how long it, uh, you know, the battery lasts and, and stuff like that. I assume, you know, you get quite a few, probably dozens of uh, charges out of the internal battery, I would have uh, thought. So you can just take it with you and they charge and you take them out and it keeps them in there and they don't rattle around and that's really neat design. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, obviously, on a mailbag, I'm not going to do a teardown, but I don't know if you wanted to see a Micro teardown of one of these micro, you know, the microelectronics inside these things. I don't know. Leave it in the comments, but yeah, they're okay. Um, I don't have this is the only Bluetoothy earbud thing I have, so it might come in handy.
So they're supposed to be sweatproof as well. They, I don't think they're waterproof, so you know, sweatproof instead of waterproof for a reason. So you wouldn't want to swim with them. Um, and apparently it's got active noise cancellation. I didn't try that. I don't like uh, noise cancelling stuff. I don't need noise cancelling stuff. I don't like tuning out the world. I like listening into the world, uh, which is why I prefer like open back uh, headphones and why I prefer um, unsealed earbuds like these. Ah, there you go. 900 milliamp uh, hour capacity. 85 milliamp hour uh, capacity in the earbuds. Um, is that both combined? Uh, that'd be each, okay? Yeah, so you'll get, you know, a few charges out of that. That's all right. And wireless uh, range up to 10 meters. I, I actually got more than that. I was getting like on the other side of my house before they uh, decided to uh, drop out. So yeah, I was probably getting 20 meters. Something like that, I'd say, before they were dropping out. So I think that's a bit conservative. Yeah, I had no problems with the uh, range at all. I was able to walk around the house, no worries. And I didn't read the uh, manual that I've got here, but I figured out uh, that you touch them and it speaks to you as well. Um, and you can uh, and you can just touch the uh, sides that got capacitive touch sense, and you can increase and decrease the volume. I figured that one out, and looks like it's got some other functionality as well. Or oh, you can master reset. Just hold them both down. Next up, we've got the classic brown masking tape from Hong Kong. Uh, thank you. Hi to all my viewers in Hong Kong. So let's crack it open. I won't tell you what it says on the uh, front. It's a bit of a mystery. I don't know. Um, we have a note. I won't actually read it yet. I just want to have a look. Well, spin, 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 spin. It's... don't know if it's new or it, it looks... Yeah, look, shrink wrap. But what do we got? What do we got? Uh, it's a two-in-one oscilloscope. Ah, oh, for nursey, nursey again, for nursey again. What's this, like the third suck of the salve? And a SIG gen. Whoa, look at that. Um, that looks pretty funky. I like it. <laughs> it's kind of like colorful, you know? Um, but, all right, well, uh, yeah, they might have to be separate videos. I, like, when you get stuff like this in the mail bag, you can't, like, do it in, like, five minutes. Not even a teardown, really. It's addressed to the handsome and humorous Dave Jones. Well, <laughs> if you insist. Um, uh, Asil from, uh, for Nursey. I, look, come on. We, we need an official pronunciation. I'm sure somebody's told me. But anyway, I'm a Sewell from Fursey. May you remember? Yes, I do remember. Our R&D slowed down the first two years, but this year we released because, you know, something happened of some unspecified, unknown origin happened for the last two years. Then we'll, we release a lot of devices. This time we bring you our uh, DSO 2C2 combination of transistor, detec transistor detector and oscilloscope. Please don't tell me they've put a transistor tester in an oscilloscope. It's bad enough when it's in a multimeter. In an oscilloscope, do they mean curve tracer? They might... No! Oh, look, it's got... Oh, yeah. Look, it's got a zip socket on the front. This wishes. Thank you very much. Well, let's check them out briefly because, yeah, um, it's going to require a second channel video if people want to see the full Monty. Thank <laughs> you. 